car stops. He gets out of the right side. And so we're informed, engage the vehicle. Guy's got a gun getting out. I'm, I'm not able to shoot. Just as I'm cursing myself, the left rear door opens up and a woman gets out carrying her baby. And I'm like, oh my God, that was so lucky I didn't shoot. I'm making my break. I key the mic to tell trail not to engage. Well, I hit the mic, don't engage, and woof, a rocket comes out. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear a second round combat story with longtime Night Stalker from the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, or SOAR, Steve Lapping. Steve spent 31 years in Army aviation, including two decades in 160th at the tip of the spear, flying the MH6 and AH-6. This second round interview is chock full of combat scenarios that Steve found himself in across 15 combat deployments. This time, we focus primarily on his time flying guns in 160th. We talk vehicle interdictions, weapon malfunctions, danger close shots, near friendlies and women and children, a Duke's a hazard like chase, weaponeering and more. Steve also shares his experience on the Saddam Hussein capture, including something I'd never heard before about the aftermath of that operation and the somber experience covering ground forces as they recovered the remains of Americans who didn't survive the Jessica Lynch capture. Many will recall our first interview with Steve, which was a clear favorite for so many listeners and seen or heard by over 200,000 people as we touched on Steve's childhood, decision to join the military, and that's a great story or the advice he receives comes from an unexpected role model, and his combat experiences in objectives Reindeer and Leadville, which included a distinguished flying cross. One thing that has impressed me so much about Steve, beyond being a CW5, and the unbelievable number of years he spent rowing the boat, as he puts it, which is a reference to being at the very tip of that spear, is the humility and how he put his family as close to first as the mission will allow in special operations. Wrapping up a storied career with the same wife and his children still by his side. With that, please enjoy this second wild ride from the cockpit of one of the baddest aircraft on the planet, no bias of course, with Steve Lapping. Steve, thanks so much for taking the time to come back for round two with us on uh, Combat Story. We're so excited to have you again. Oh, this is great. I appreciate you having me back on, Ryan. So one of the things I wanted to ask, um, how many, how many, uh, hours do you think people have viewed of our last interview? If you had to venture a guess. How many hours? Yeah. Uh, shoot. I don't know. 65,000. 65,000. Yeah. Woo. So, uh, I'm long winded. A couple hundred thousand. <laughs> no, no, no. A couple hundred thousand folks have, have gone back to watch that. And I only bring it up because we're going to touch on so many new things here, but for people who want to get the the full background on you, kind of how you grew up, some of the crazy shenanigans that you shared with us out on the ice, um, flight school and, and the decision to get into aviation to begin with, that's all in this other episode that has touched a lot of people, I think. And we've gotten some great, great feedback. And I hope you have too, directly um, from folks who have seen that. But for people who need the the um, abridged version, you were 31 years, 31 and a half years in Army aviation, 21 of those in SOAR. Yeah, with 160th, you've flown all kinds of aircraft from 58s to AH-6s, MH-6s, MH-60s. Um, you've been in LNO, you've done a language thing, you've done all, all sorts of, uh, of crazy things, but a lot of it in the cockpit with thousands of hours. So um, with that, there's a lot of stuff to jump into here, but we just recently wrapped an interview with our second also with Pete Blaber, uh, former Delta commander. And he just came out with a book about the last battle of Pat Tillman's um, life. Uh, very interesting look at the um, toxic leadership climate, but also some of the compounding of um, decisions that led to Pat Tillman's uh, tragic death. But um, on a lighter note, I have an embarrassment of riches is what I have to call it of 
what you <laughs> sent to me in advance for this uh, this discussion of just 31 years of time in uniform. And one of the topics had Pete Blaver. So I thought maybe we could start there. You could share uh, that connection point with us. Yeah, sure. So some of the stories I had are directly related to aviation, combat deployments, and others were just humorous, you know, as, as you go through, uh, like I said, 31 years of, of service, there's some, some funny stories. And I tried to go back and uh, uh, remember some that were retellable. There's some that I probably couldn't. But uh, this particular one was I was a fairly new member of the unit and had just made fully mission qualified, which meant that I'd probably been there a couple years. And a opportunity came up to do a pre-deployment site survey for some training that we were going to do down in South America, some jungle training with uh, the special forces guys. And usually it's a flight lead that does that, someone who's more experienced, but no one was available. So uh, as usual, my, my lucky chances were because I was, you know, right time, right place. So I was selected to go to Panama to brief the SOC South commander and then go to uh, South America to the country and, and do the site survey. Well, I linked up with the guys from the Special Forces, Pete Labor being a young captain at the time and a, another member uh, with him. And so the three of us go down to Panama together and we brief the SOC South commander of what we're going to do, what we're going to look for. And once the official part of the the visit there is over, we decide to get a little something to eat and then maybe hit one or two of the clubs in downtown Panama City. And uh, it was uh, – and for those of you who, who know Pete Blaber, he's a good-looking guy and just kind of tall, you know, very – you would – if you were a female, you would find him very attractive. Frustratingly, frustratingly attractive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, you know, those – those ugly girls who hang around the good looking girls, you know, to get attention. That would have, that would have been my role in this particular instance. <laughs> so the three of us walk into a club and, and as clubs are doing at that hour of the night, it's probably midnight, you know, boom, boom, boom. And there's hundreds of people there. And it's just packed. And we walk in and you can kind of just feel the vibe change, you know, with the three of us kind of standing just inside the doorway and, I, I can feel this this change in the atmosphere, and I look around and I see some girls and more girls, and these girls are starting to pay more and more attention to us. Well, maybe not us, maybe you know Pete, <laughs> and we're just we're standing there, and after maybe thirty seconds, Pete's got his hands on his hips, and he turns to me and goes, "Man, I could really use a cigarette after all this eye sex I'm getting." <laughs> And I just like, oh, you are the man. It was, it was just funny. I hadn't spent a lot of time with the ground force prior to that on that type of relationship, but a very decent, down to earth, good guy. And I really enjoyed uh, that trip and working with him later as he went to to command the unit as well. Man, you know, there's something that, as I've interviewed him twice now, I was just struck by how calm he is. And yes. I, I don't know if that, you know, what, if it was true when he was a captain or he learned it over time through the special ops community. But I think my question to you is, um, what kind of training did you end up getting Steve in terms of just like being present in the moment during a gunfight or an op and just calming down? Um, if, if at all, like I, I just assume in that special ops community, you're working with psych folks and you're really thinking about that level of of the mission like was there anything that you worked on to be calm and steady in and up i think there a lot of self-reflection but i think the after action reviews were pretty much the the main teaching points and so every after action review we did we like to refer to them as brutally honest and meaning that you couldn't have thin skin. And so when you came back from a training mission or a combat mission, we sat down and I'm sure others have said this before, if it was an hour mission, we debriefed for two hours yeah. and it was 
well, you made this phone call, or excuse me, you made this radio call and your voice sounded a little high and excited. Try to remain calm because it helps the flow, the focus of everyone else. And if you're upset, it's going to get them upset. And I think just the peer uh, interaction and review from them, it was probably the, the better education that I got in things like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. And then another question that I had for you specifically, just as I was preparing for this, 31 years is a long time in uniform. I, ca I can't even venture a guess of how many commanders you must have supported throughout that time frame. Um, sure. But I'm, I'm curious if there are one or two that come to mind as like, this person was a phenomenal commander for this reason. Um, just because you've seen so many of them, you've probably seen all kinds, like the good and the bad. I think that I was very fortunate from the time I was a uh, W1 in the CAV until my retirement. Just had some phenomenal commanders. Had some young lieutenants that needed a little bit of work, but that's what you know young lieutenants do. And uh, none that were really uh, so negative that obviously it affected me to get out. So I would say I've heard stories from others that maybe they didn't have the same path, but my very first commander, well, I'll tell you this short story about commanders. So as I went in the CAV, everything you're told in flight school, you know, the CAV, dirty, you know, muddy boots, Stetson, Stetson. beard, and all that. So I show up to the CAV, the third ACR in Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. And I get assigned to the scout troop because I'm a scout pilot. And my introduction to my platoon leader is uh, Terry, and he is a Mormon. And he introduces me to Jerry, the attack platoon leader, who is a virgin. And these guys were as white bread as white bread could get. Nicest guys, great commanders. But when I showed up to the cab, you know, I'm thinking that there's going to be these young single guys and we're going to go hit the club every night and get in fights and drink beer and all that. And it, it just wasn't like that uh, for this particular start. And so I, I just thought that was kind of funny. I'm like, hmm. I That's think they great. lied to me. It's not. <laughs> like, we're not drinking beer out of the Stetsons right now? Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, exactly. But, but my troop commander was awesome, uh, Miguel Alfaro and his family. They took me in because I was a young single uh, trooper and you had me over to their house and, and really showed me what a, a commander should be, you know, and, and when later when I became uh, more senior, I, I tried to emulate some of those things, but within the uh, regiments, and there have been so many just good commanders uh, who I would single out. And uh, he's been on, on the air several times. I've seen him, uh, Clayton Hutmacher, and he is just a, a phenomenal guy all the way from uh from an enlisted marine to a army warrant officer to a two-star general now retired and there are some things that that he did for me and just uh great guys yeah uh, that's really cool yeah to go from enlisted marine to two-star general is no no small task obviously um, and, and the other thing, just before we jump into some of these other stories, Steve, is we just passed uh, another anniversary for 9-11. And um, as I was looking at our first interview, I don't think we touched on where you were when that, uh, when that event happened. So I was hoping we could get that story from you. Sure. Rowing the boat. So we refer to rowing the boat as, as those individuals that are at the line companies that are working flying, doing missions, training, deployment, whatever it may be. And so we had gotten a training mission to go to Poland. And so we were on a C-17 with our aircraft and some boats and some other guys, and we were going to do a training mission. And we're over the Atlantic. And whenever we're deployed in a situation like that, even for training, we always have to have communications. And so the Yukamo guys had rigged a, a sat antenna up and they're monitoring SATCOM and they kind of, you could sense a little bit of a scurry. There's people going over towards the radio, you know, maybe three or four and we're all just kind of 
chilling, laying out on the, the C-17. And then now there's about 10 people. And pretty soon we just get up on our own and go over like, hey, what's going on? I said, well, a uh, plane just ran into one of the towers. And we're like, oh, my goodness, thinking it's a Cessna 172 or something. And the information we were getting was coming from uh, intelligence uh, gathering not NBC or anything like that. And so we were getting maybe a little bit more uh, of the, the information that the public wasn't getting and not all of it factual. So now we're hearing that uh, there's other planes missing that, uh, you know, th that there's all this stuff going on and it sounds like it's world war uh, three. And so now we've got another shoot four hours to go until we land. And we're just told to continue uh, to our destination. Do you think and it's so, part of the training exercise at all? Is there, is that going through your no, mind? You know, it's real. No, world. They, okay. Yeah. They were very specific that this is not uh, a drill. This is, is real world because we're, we're always part of that uh, deployment package that we have to be ready to go. And so immediately we're thinking, okay, we got to get there, turn around, get gas, get a crew and head back. And so we continue to monitor that. And I think some of the numbers got a little inflated about how many aircraft were missing. Um, and so we were really thinking the worst when we landed. And by that time, we had gotten some of the information uh, a little bit more uh, in check. And the unfortunate part was, is as we got off and now we're watching TV, is that it's all in Polish. So nobody knows you know, what they're saying. We're just watching the pictures. And we stayed there for about... Uh, maybe 12 hours until they could get a fresh crew in and then flew us back. And, uh, from there, you know, it's started deploying. Okay. Um, with, with that, I want to jump into some of these, uh, these items that you teed up for us. The, the first one that I wanted to go to was the black swarm and an a 10 encounter. If, uh, if we can, what is Black Swarm in this context? So the Black Swarm was uh, a name that one of the flight leads came up with just to, to give our, our mission set a name. And basically, we were given the mission of the Western Iraqi desert to seek out uh, scuds and weapons of mass destruction was going to a little bit later be uh, a part of our mission sets. But... Our mission for this was teams of little birds and A-10s. And so we had one M-86 with a FLIR, two A-86s and two A-10s. And we had four of these teams with corridors on the Western Iraqi desert. And so our mission was to set out each night and go and ensure that uh, nothing could influence other countries to join in this uh, OIF, uh, onset. And we had, we were very fortunate because we had the chance to practice this in the States before we left. And so the intent was the MH. Well, we kind of knew where we were going to be going. You know, the idea was we'd have a predetermined set of uh, spots that we'd go and reconnoiter, find out, if they're good, bad, engage them if we needed to, and then move to the next one and just night after night. And so the MH would go and look with their FLIR, find the target, the AHs would engage, and then the A-10s would engage. Well, we practiced that. Uh, things went pretty good. And that's when, after we had practiced it a couple of times in the States, I think we were up at Fort Knox, Kentucky. We took that same mission set to uh, overseas on our deployments. And one particular night, my job was to call the AHs clear. So the A-10s were free to engage. And on this particular mission, I, we had done it a couple nights. So maybe I was a little complacent and we find our objective. We engage as the AH team. And as we're pulling off the objective, I call us clear and maybe a little prematurely. And so as I call us clear, 
as we're in the pattern, I was probably at the very onset of the pattern and he was just the opposite. He, he was at the very point where he could engage within seconds, you know, cause yeah, they tend because maybe he's in the outer edge of his turn and it'll take him 30 seconds to get in. Well, no. So when I call this clear, we're just clear of the objective and he is ready to fire. And he pulled the trigger on that uh, Gatlin gun that they have. And I could just feel it shake the aircraft. I mean, they were that close. And, and he saw us. He, he knew he was clear, but it, it's something that I wasn't really prepared for. And so, you know, thought to self, all right, give him a couple seconds on that. Don't try to be so cool, you know, where, where these guys are going to simultaneous engage as we are. And if if this is like too sensitive, just say so. Um, it seems odd to pair up a little bird with an A-10. Like just, I, I think if somebody were to just search those up online, you'd see a small helicopter and this beast of, of a fixed wing. Um, what is the rationale behind pairing them up? Is it, it's the firepower, it's the high, low capability. What, what is the rationale on that? Well, I think for that particular mission set is we weren't sure what we were going to come up on. The Intel wasn't real good at that time. We're, we're pushing, west to east and everyone else the big army is focused from south to north coming up more along the the lines of the euphrates uh through basra and and kuwait up through saudi and so we don't have a lot of support out there we've got some special forces ground vehicles and part of our later task force tf tank so which is maybe a, even more odd pairing but the a10s were primarily to engage something that came up that we weren't expecting because for the most part, which we, you know, you don't know what you don't know. The AHs were able to, to sustain ourselves, but we definitely felt much better having those A-10s there. And, and we worked with them in the States all the time. And later on when we were working CAS and there wasn't a ground controller, uh, we controlled uh, airstrikes. That's pretty cool with an A-10 coming in. A-10, F-18s, uh, 16s, 15s, and we actually became uh, JTACs. Or, I'm sorry, FACs. So, uh -huh. with the JTACs, either in conjunction with them or a FAC, we had a FAC A. He was a um, liaison and worked with the Marines out in Mott's doing the, uh, the weapons tactics instruction. So we were very uh, fortunate to have him and he trained us up. Um, I actually left the unit just before that training block. So I, I didn't get an official uh, fact designation, but the pilots did. And that became very helpful because there's some fast mover pilots that wouldn't drop if you weren't a fact. And uh, I saw that actually come into play when I was at LNO many several years later and this is when fallujah and ramadi were hot and we saw a terrorist training camp i mean literally you know there's 70 guys out there with their rifles doing exercises and we're like wait this is too good to be true you know all these guys are in this one place and we confirm that it is a a terrorist training camp and so the ahs are are scrambled to get out there we get the AHs there, they expend all their ammunition, but they have enough fuel. And so now we're trying to get fast movers over there and there's no ground force. It's just one of those opportunities that we had. And the, I won't say what service it was, but the first two aircraft on station are asking, you know, give us a sit rep, what's going on. And they're in the stack stack being aircraft that are just stacked up on top of each other. And let's say it's 8,000 is the lower stack. They engage first, they move out the next aircraft move down from 9,000 to 8,000. They talk with the fire supporter and they engage. Well, in this particular case, it was two AHs out there and they're giving the situation of what's going on. They're like, Hey, 
excuse me, we've got a bunch of guys. We should have dropped bombs from this to that. And, and we were well versed in uh, the cast call for fire or the nine line. And the guys wouldn't drop. And they said, well, I, I can't drop without a fact. It's OK, fine. Clear out of the stack. And so they went to hold somewhere and the next guys came down like, hey, this is who I am. This is what's going on. There's no ground force. Are you will you will you drop? And the guy said, right on, I'll do it. <laughs> and so boom, they they dropped bombs with good effects. The next guys came down. And after about two engagements, the guy, the first guys came back on the radio kind of sheepishly and like, hey, can we get back in the stack? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so sure enough, you know, they put him back in and, and just did uh, great things that night. Uh, but it, it did show a need to get us uh, trained for that particular situation. Man, and you mentioned the the not, uh, also just for people listening to FAC, a forward air controller. So not quite a JTAC who you've heard on this show before, but somebody who is. Uh, been trained to your point and qualified to call in uh, a strike, but maybe not at the PhD level where you might see a JTAC. Um, you mentioned the nine line and people have probably heard it before, but you've got two kinds of nine lines, right? You've got like a medical nine line and then you've got the call, a close air support, bringing in a fast mover to take a shot or a helicopter in some cases. But uh, the question I had for you, Steve, is Within one sixtieth, how often were you using a nine line to to put rounds on a target? Like somebody calling you in with a nine line? Mm, probably rarely. Yeah. And the reason being is that we trained with these guys so often that we had SOPs that were very familiar to both of us. And if it was uh, a pre-assault or if it was pre-planned, we knew exactly what was going to go on. So it was more like, okay, are you doing what you're doing? Yes. All right. Are you doing what you're doing? And so we had a good understanding. We knew where the flop was, where the forward line was, the targets were set and it reduced the engagement time. And to go through a full nine line is more uh, geared towards a fixed wing, a fast mover showing up with no idea what's going on. You know, he's area, uh, support. So he's coming down from say Basra and he comes up to Baghdad and like, Hey, I understand you guys need me. Well, he's got to read him that whole situation. Whereas we sat down and we planned for six hours with the ground force. And so we're much more familiar with what's going on. Uh, we have done nine lines where we were called just like the, the fixed swing cast would be, but uh, definitely more rare. Got it. Yeah. Perfect. Um, it, we have the Saddam capture on here, which we didn't really touch on last time. So I, I was hoping we could jump into that. And I think for a lot of these stories, we also have to give people context of what aircraft you're in because you've flown so many and, uh, and maybe the year for Saddam, it's a little bit easier, but, um, what was your role in that, Steve? Sure. So a, a couple of uh, high names yeah, and a uh, high value target HVT. And these missions were not quite as exciting as you would think, you know, maybe they make a movie out of it or something, but I think all the description are pretty accurate. Um, and it's almost anticlimactic, climatic after going after him for so many times. And so as we did the initial invasion uh, all secure. Now we're going after the deck of cards and we're getting uh, Saddam's cook. We're getting, you know, all these, all these uh, supporters, but really obviously everyone wants the, the number one guy. They want to get Saddam. And so now we're getting into the end of the year and we've probably been on myself. I've probably been on at least three that were pretty serious and you knew that they were serious by the amount of support that you got. So if you're told, oh, hey, we think we may have the, uh, what was he, the ace of spades, I think was his card. And we're like, oh, okay. And, you know, the first time they tell you that everyone's excited and they're over there and we're planning and we're going to do this. Uh, but uh, after it, it doesn't come to fruition and then the second, the third time, like, yeah, all right. You took everyone serious, but it's just kind of like, well, maybe or maybe not. And so this time we got notified, 
hey, we think we got actionable intelligence on uh, on the big guy again, and, and we're going to go after him. And we're like, okay, great. Sounds good. But there is a lot of activity. There's guys scurrying about. We're getting told that these assets are going to be available. These assets are going to be available. We're taking the all the teams that we have and they're going to support this effort. So you could definitely tell that there was a lot more emphasis put on this uh, particular mission night. And so this was the uh, in December 2003. And obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but in March of 2003 is when all this started. So I'm not real good at math, but I think that's about nine months later that we've been looking for all these guys and especially him. And so this night we were told it's it's not that he's protected by a massive uh, armada of bodyguards and soldiers it's pretty much that he's by himself you know cowering in a hole somewhere uh, and the intelligence we got was was pretty damn good uh so we take off and we're based out of baghdad now and we went up to to crit and we restaged there, got gas, and the ground force didn't want the aviation around too much to spook anything with the with the noise. So we all the aviation assets stayed based there in Tikrit. The ground force went off, and as soon as they got to a certain point, they called. We launched, and we being the AH Team 1, they went to a holding that was within five minutes where they couldn't be heard. And the ground force was able to locate uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, capture him. And during this whole time, we're monitoring the radios and we keep caught. So we're AH Team 2 now just sitting in Tikrit on the airfield for, I don't know, this is maybe hour four. And we're calling the the lead team. Hey, you guys ready to change out? You know, everyone wants to be involved. And they're like, nope, we got it. I'm like, come on, man. I know you're low on fuel. We'll, we'll change out with it. And they're like, nope, we got it. And so my my participation in the event was a lot of good planning went into this. We executed just as uh, planned and briefed. A lot of assets because obviously it warranted that. But when they got him, they took him back to the palace in uh, Tikrit, and we were notified our services are no longer needed in a tactical mode, but go ahead and spool everybody up and come to the palace. And so we thought, oh, that's kind of weird. You know, the mission was over pretty much. So all the aviation elements, uh, we start up and we move to that area, shut down, we go inside and the commander there said, this is kind of a binny for everybody, for all your efforts in, into this. And we're going to bring you into the room and we're going to bring Saddam Hussein through you. And you can say to him whatever you want. You can take pictures. And, you know, this is your opportunity to, to see the, the, the end result of all your efforts. And I thought that, man, that's pretty cool. You know, a lot of times you wouldn't get that opportunity. So we went inside and there's probably, and I've seen a couple pictures of this. Um, of course, we're always told, don't bring a camera with you. And now we're told, hey, if you got a camera, you go ahead. And and it's it's it was incredible how many people actually had cameras. I didn't have a camera, so I'm like, damn. Um, but he walked by me probably five feet and it, it was, uh, surreal because, um, much in the sense that as I described the atmosphere changing with Pete Blaber in the club, something like that, but on a much more sinister, uh, feel I, and this, it just felt bad. You know, that that this was not a good guy. And, yeah, you know, I'm not being uh, my my description of it is very difficult because it was just a weird feeling. You know, maybe it was just evil, but you could tell that this was a bad guy and nobody really said anything. And the only person who said something was one of the female interpreters. And 
as is the the way she threw her a sandal. Maybe she'd been carrying it in her knapsack forever, you know, but she threw a sandal at him, uh, not at him, but in his direction and said a couple things. You know, uh, I assume that she had a personal connection, family members or something, and she was a little upset. But the rest of us just watched him uh, led past us and he was put on a Black Hawk taken down south. Uh, and later, we were actually given the opportunity to guard him. So it was another Benny. You know, obviously, they really didn't need people. Uh, they, we weren't short on people to guard Saddam. But we were offered the opportunity, hey, if, if you want, you take some time out of your off time and you can go guard Saddam and see him and stand next to him. And all of us are like, eh, now that's okay. Uh, which in retrospect, all of us probably would have, you know, when, I don't know. It's just, uh, it, it is historical, you know, it, and it's not uh, a good thing for him. I wouldn't want to have talked to him or anything, but just, uh, I don't know, maybe you could have learned something just by observing him. I, I'm really, I had never heard that. That's a really interesting story and in how the command, I guess, decided to bring you all in. Um, I think I feel kind of proud to hear that nobody said anything as you walked by, you know, it's just like, we did our job. This is what you get. Yeah. And you didn't need to say anything there. I think there's something to that. Like probably says a lot about the people in the room, the operators that got to that point. Um, one thing that you mentioned last time, Steve, that really struck at, stuck uh, with me was the the feeling in 160th after Somalia, right? Um, talking about some of the people coming back and the heavy emotions there. What were the emotions like after this? Because I think a lot of us, we, we followed the bin Laden hunt so closely because it took so long. And as you mentioned, this took nine months. It, you know, it felt quick in retrospect. But what was the feeling like there? Well, so this is still, you know, obviously this campaign went on for years and years and years. So after nine months and we really didn't have a big loss of troops. Uh, and so it, this was I, I think it was a sense of joy that, hey, we're done with this. We can now pack things up and go home, you know, and that, and that this was going to be closure. And obviously it wasn't, and it went on for much longer with much worse results, casualties, deaths. But I, th I think everyone was just happy. It felt like the universe was being set right. You know, that this guy was no longer a threat to his people or anyone. And we had a hand in that. And so I think we all felt good about ourselves. Didn't tell ourselves that or didn't tell the guy next to us, um, which is one of our, our, not a motto, but someone had come up to me, one of the junior guys and go, Hey, Steve, I'm really not sure if I'm, if I'm doing well, how do I know if I'm doing well here in the unit? And I was like, well, did anyone tell you you fucked up? No, there you go. <laughs> that's, that's your pat on the back. That's great. Just a quick thanks to our sponsor, HelloFresh. And we'll get right back to this combat story. You know, what's better than eating MREs. HelloFresh. Oh, how our family loves HelloFresh. We've used it for over three years to prepare delicious meals for our family of five at least three to four nights every week. And I was an avid user before they sponsored us. I make it a personal point to avoid the grocery store at all costs these days. During this time of year with kids at school, going to after school events, work, travel, there's just not a lot of time left over to shop. HelloFresh literally delivers every ingredient to your door for each meal. So you're not stuck with some items that you use once and never touch again, which then take up space in your kitchen. Some nights when we're really busy, I'll jump for a HelloFresh quick and easy recipe. Last night, for instance, I made shrimp tacos and it was both a family favorite and let us get the kids to sports in time. It was faster and healthier than delivery. Our family has had so many HelloFresh meals that we would have again, with some favorites being one pan pork fajita lettuce wraps, beef flauta supreme, honey barbecue pork chops, bulgogi and firecracker meatballs, sun-dried tomato and spaghetti, and more. You can order meals for two or four, and we've always ordered for four, which feeds our family of five. And that includes three growing boys who tend to eat us out of house and home. So go to hellofresh.com slash five zero combat story and use that same code five zero combat story for 50% off 
plus 15% off the next two months. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50CombatStory and use that code 50CombatStory for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. And now, back to this combat story. Um, so transitioning gears just slightly here. Um, you've got a few um, events listed that are day VIs, which I'm assuming are vehicle interdictions. Um, so you correct. correct me if I'm wrong, but some of them involve danger close. So I wanted to take a second to just ask you if you could describe for people listening, what does danger close mean, a danger close shot? And how many times do you think you ended up taking them if you had to put a number on it or if you could even put a number on it? So in the realm of call for fire, danger close is when the ordinance or the effects of can uh, cause collateral damage to either those that you're supporting or others. It could be civilians on the on the outset of the engagement area. And so depending on what type of weapon system you're firing, you have parameters. OK, well, I'm going to shoot minigun. I can get this close to what I'm shooting and or those I'm supporting uh, rockets. And so each weapon system, so uh, called weaponeering. So knowing what you're going to be shooting, you have to know the effects of that as well, which, you know, you being an Apache guy, you well versed in that. So the saying, you know, once you fire a bullet, you can't get it back. And so you have to know what's going to happen with that. When the situation warrants and either you call it or the ground force calls it that you are within those parameters, meaning that there is the possibility of of injury to them with you shooting so close. And so an example would be we had ground forces being engaged with small arms fire and the guys were real close in a wood line and they couldn't get away from them. And they called in call for fires from us. And when they give a description, I knew where they were at and they gave a description of where the enemy was at. It was very close. And they called that it was going to be danger close. And and we don't we didn't really look at it as a CYA. Well, you know, I had to get that coverage. But again, the fixed wing coming in, not knowing something like that, that is part of that uh, SOP, you know, where they have to say, hey, when I drop this 500 pound bomb man, I could kill everybody. And so it has to be accepted for us uh, a little bit more surgical and the surgical with the the minuscule scalpel is the 7.62 minigun and we can get very close with that and that day we were shooting within 30 feet of, get uh, out. Of the bad guys yeah they they were very close uh we had a small number and the thing about the vi force was um we only had about 20 assaulters so if we were on the ground for any amount of time, that was bad. And they just didn't have uh, enough ammo to support themselves. So the intent for all VI missions was get in and get out. And if you're there longer than 20 minutes, uh, your plan <laughs> your plan has gone awry. And that's that's not what we want. Did you have to get initials for a danger close shot from the ground force? No, uh, I remember this particular one, and this is, I think we had talked about it last uh, with Leadville, that I see plainly, I see where the, the JTAC is. I know where the bad guys are at because I could see them shooting. And it was really starting to get to be uh, an overwhelming event from bad guys coming into the, the objective area. and. Working with these guys, they were very comfortable with us shooting uh, as they directed. And thank God it, it all worked out. We were able to engage the enemy, no collateral damage. And, you know, the the after call, usually you get effects of your shots was like, oh, damn, yeah, that was close, but good shooting. And uh you know, and when you do something like that, you don't shoot right into the objective area. You go a little further out and then you bring the the 
weapons effects into it just to make sure give yourself a little bit of slack yeah jeez yeah for people who haven't listened to maybe some of some of those special operator assaulters on the ground anytime they talk about an ah6 it's just like nothing but praise and the the greatest shots so it's no surprise so one of these day vis there, there are many here um i think probably some comical and some very serious um, the first one is a Dukes of Hazard reference, so I, I definitely want to hear that. And then there's another one that I think is probably a little bit tougher that involves uh, danger close near children. So maybe let's start with the Dukes of Hazard, though. Yeah, it, it's going between day and night. So we knew what cycle we were going to be on when we went over there. We're going to be the day crew. We're going to be the night crew. And the day was the most boring mission uh, maybe perhaps for days, just nothing going on. You're sitting there at a desk playing. Uh, I, I wasn't a big video, but the guys are, you know, eight hours of playing the, the call of duty. Yeah. That's what it was called. Call of duty. But it's one of those things when the bell rings, uh, we've got the aircraft all set up and they'll just yell in mission. And we jump up and we have no idea what the mission is. You run out to the aircraft, you crank up, and it was always a race. Who could get started faster, us or the Blackhawks, and get to the starting line and the ground force, or excuse me, the, the takeoff point. And the ground force is you know, running and getting what they can and meeting us out there. And so in a very, very short amount of time from our initial alert until we're in the aircraft cranked up, on the taxi, and we always had priority, everyone else in the airfield stopped, um, we're given our takeoff clearance. And all we know is north, south, east, or west. And so, you know, again, all these, um, all these days, so let's say it's a 30-day or 60-day rotation, probably 70%, 80% are pretty mundane, not a lot going on. But that other time, uh, it, it's either... Uh, maybe humorous or it's uh it's terrifying and so the, the dukes of hazard story was just some knucklehead uh ied maker and down south south of baghdad and we're called hey get going we got this guy we know he's he's moving and so the task force which is the day task force which is two mh6s uh, two eight sixes and two sixties, two Blackhawk M eight sixties with the ground force. We start heading that way, and this guy is bad, but we think he can bring us on to something bigger. And so the, the different types of missions. All right, once you find this guy, what are you going to do with him? Well, we could either disable the vehicle, shoot the driver and anyone else in the vehicle and try to keep who we're after alive or just kill everybody. So the three different types of missions. And basically we knew what it was going to be when we're before we get to the vehicle. And so this one was, uh, I had a driver. We weren't real concerned about him, but we wanted the other guy. And so as we pull up to the vehicle and engage uh, the driver was not having any of that. So he thought he was going to be able to get away. So he just floors it and he is paralleling this canal and just driving like a crazy man. And, you know, obviously it, it's drive crazy or death. And he comes up on this little, uh, not a roadblock, but just some debris in the road and he hits that and it's just like a ramp and he just flies up in the air and we're watching it. And, you know, it, it's, it's comical, you know, it, there is, you know, the, the human uh, loss of this, but just watching this car and the guy's a bad guy. So, and he starts going sideways and I'm thinking that is just like the Dukes of Hazard. You know, we're talking about in the cockpit. Oh, man, watch this. And he rolls a little bit and just splash right in the canal. And uh, I, I would imagine if you could have got everyone's reaction, it would have been, oh, man, did anyone get that on video? You know, and uh, the car went under and, and both of them were lost. But 
just things like that. You never knew what would happen on a day VI. They were always uh, interesting. And just to think of the context switching, like this is a term that, w- that we hear a lot in the private sector now, but to go from like, hey, I'm playing Call of Duty for seven hours to you have to get out in this aircraft in like five minutes, take off and go be incredibly situationally aware and on point for about 20 minutes. It just seems crazy, I think, for many people to hear. But it's the reality. Like you said, the, the 20 to 30 percent of the time you're there, it's like everybody is full attention on what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and if you were sitting inside an air conditioned room, that was good. A lot of times we were forward deployed because we knew somebody was in that area. Now we're just waiting for him to leave to go from A to B. So A being his point of origin, which is a bad guy place, and B where his destination, and it's a bad guy place. So the intent was to... Um, mm engage him or whatever we're going to do somewhere in between. And so the closer we could get, the better chance we had of that. And I remember being in some just remote locations and in the summertime, and it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit there. And the half, the helicopter assault force, just landed and maybe we're at the end of this, uh, this taxiway. And we literally are standing underneath this, a uh, six inch rotor blade because that's the only shade that we have. And we're there for an hour Just and we're like, Oh my God, we're dying. And the, uh, the air force, uh, rescue crew there, you know, with the fire trucks, they must've been sitting in their air conditioned tower, looking at us, just feeling so sorry for us that they drive out, give us some cold bottles of water. And we're like, Oh, thank you very much. Why so, couldn't you go sit with them? Yeah, well, we we had to be ready to crank. Jeez. Uh, as a matter of fact, for that particular one, I remember it was Western Iraq. And that one we were... I, I remember the mood was, was just bad for us because it was the end of the day. We're in the Western Iraq, which is just always a nasty place. And this guy is going further west. So when we're merging, it's always easier because we're going to get there sooner, do what we need to do and, and get done. Well, this guy's going west and we're east. So we got to go west. Now we got to catch him. So he's driving, you know, 70, 80 miles an hour. We're flying a 90, 100 knots. And we're looking at the, the GPS. We're looking at where he's at. We're like, man, we're going to be here all damn day. Hold dinner for us. <laughs> And so uh, we get out there and this guy was a, he was a, a thug, uh, low level. And it was going to be a capture if we can, but most likely kill because he was, he was known to uh, brandish a weapon first. And this was shortly after we had had the displays put in our cockpit. So we are now able to see what the ISR asset is looking at. And so this ISR asset has been following them for a while and we're chasing them and we're chasing them. And, you know, eventually we're gaining on them. And these guys knew that we were out there. And so they were always looking for us. So as we're flying, we're starting to get closer and closer, starting to get into that mindset. Okay. Game face on. We're, we're getting within range. Well, he sees us in his rearview mirror and he stops the car. And we see that on our display in the cockpit. We're like, all right, he knows we're here. And he gets out and he is like a scarface. He's got an AK-47 and he holds it out like this. And he's yelling at us, you know, probably telling us what terrible things he's going to do to us and how much he hates us. And we're just kind of looking at each other like, oh, man, this guy is got some anger issues here and and it's just kind of surreal because we're looking at it from the isr display we're probably still a mile out but as we got closer he's got an ak-47 we've got a 50 caliber machine gun and you know with a 2000 meter max effective range and he just uh he stood there to the end and uh thought he was going to affect something, but it didn't work out good for him. But the, the uh, addition 
of those displays in the cockpit really gave us an advantage. Yeah, the, just the situational awareness. Exactly. Minutes or, you know, 30 minutes in advance, probably. Yeah. Special. Um, actually, on that topic, um, I've, I've re-interviewed several guests recently to really get at... Um, it's for a, a larger documentary that I'm trying to pull together, but we talk a little bit more about some of the tougher moments and just something that you brought up here, I, I'd ask you, and I'm not trying to glorify any of the violence or, or death, but when you talk about seeing a person out there and, and knowing you're going to have to pull the trigger, do you remember the first time you had to pull the trigger on, on another, like a human target? Um, yeah, I guess two stories. One was, um, at night in the Western and the other one was, I think you had mentioned that, which I didn't address was the, uh, the vehicle interdiction to a stopping point where the guy got out and was trying to get into a house. And so in that particular one, this was a, so we never wanted to get into a, uh, assault situation, meaning that we wanted to get these guys in the open, preferably they're in the car or they stop at the car and get out and run. And, and, you know, they're not going very far, but in this particular situation, he was getting very close to his destination and the ground force commander has the ability to call it. All right. Uh, he's too close. Let, let's, he, he won this one. We'll get him tomorrow. But this guy was, uh, en enough of a, a menace. He was another IED maker, but uh, had been very active. And so they really wanted him. And as we come upon him, he gets the car stops. They know we're here. He gets out and he starts running to a house. And the ground force commander is, uh, had already called it off. Okay, AH is going, you're going to engage. And he sees what's going on. He sees how close this guy is to the house. There's people out in the, in the compound. There's kids running. And he said, hey, uh, varmint, which was our call sign, do not let him get in the house. Because if he does, they're going to have to assault the house. And we don't know what's in there, what's around. It's going to turn into a, a long, sustained gunfight is what they're worried about. And so I was right on top of him and was uh, fortunate enough to have a good shooting where as this guy got 10 feet from the door, we were able to engage him and uh, skill, luck, whatever it was, there was no collateral damage. And that, that was probably something that I was just, you know, when you pull the trigger, you should never be, oh, you, hope should not be part of your equation. But, you know, in this time, it was one of the ones where I felt um, hesitant. Like, man, yeah, I, I think I can get them or I wouldn't have pulled the trigger. And so it worked out good. We were able to to take him out, no collateral damage and pack up all of our stuff and get out of there. But the other time was at the start of everything um, and uh, going back to weaponeering, uh, there's different types of rockets, 2.75s. And there's the usual is a high explosive uh, 2.75 folding fin aerial rocket. And it's either a 10 pound or a 17 pound. And the difference being, it, you don't have to be as accurate with a 17 pound and it's going to do more damage. Obviously, it has more uh, ability to, to hurt and or kill somebody. But depending on what we were doing, we could carry a mixture of rockets. And in this particular instance, we carried flechette and we carried illumination rockets. And uh, I'll tell you why I said that. But in this particular engagements, we knew that there was an observation post in the western part of uh, Iraq. And as we came by to a prearranged engagement, we shoot the house, this little OP. And when we get done engaging them, the ISR is telling us, yep, they came out of the house and they ran to a ditch. 
I'm like, okay. So they spot the ditch for us. We come back in, we shoot the ditch. They run back into the house. You shooting HE rounds, Steve? Uh, this, this, p- this was a uh, mini gun and okay. HE. Yeah. So we're, we're shooting both. And, but it's just, it's dark as heck. It's hard to see them. There's kind of clutter all over. So after the two engagements, and we're still being told by the ISR, and when I say two engagements, lead shooting, then trail shooting, and I was trail, that they were getting away. You know, they were just going back and forth. And I'm like, that's it. I'm tired of this. So as we came back in for the third engagement, lead shoots, they were running, uh, you know, back and forth. So I picked up spacing, gave them the opportunity to uh, think that we're done and, you know, run towards the other place. I think they were going from the ditch to the house this time. Well, the, the flechette is a, uh, is a shoot. Oh, all right. Back me up. If you remember this, uh, the old ones were like 2,200 nails, which were much smaller. Uh, Vietnam era, kind of. And the newer ones, I think, had 1,179 bigger nails. But they they were used for uh, troops in the open. And it has an orange chalk. So when the, excuse me, when the nails deploy, that the orange will disperse. And you know that the the rocket has, uh, has done its job. And... When you asked me, you know, when's the first time? That's when I, I knew that I had my first uh, real engagement because we used the flechette and it was spot on. And uh, all three of those guys went down and I saw called it, said, yep, hey, you got them with the with the flechette. And that's probably one of the few times we ever really used flechette because it just uh, it, it had to be the right situation to use it. It's not, it's not that scalpel that you described earlier, basically. No. Yeah. It, it can definitely have a wide dispersion. And, uh, uh but it, it was as, as a, um, gun pilot, you really had to have your, your game on to get a good flechette shot because sometimes they'll just do crazy things and, you know, whenever you got a good flechette shot at the range, you know, everyone's like, hey, good shot. <laughs> they could be crazy. <laughs> was there any, uh, over time, obviously having to pull the trigger quite a few times as we're talking about here, do you feel like that changes you at all over time? Did you notice anything like after that flechette shot, like, geez, I just took these people out? Or is it you've been trained for this, you knew what you were getting into, no real impact there? No, I don't think that ever affected me that it gave me cause to pause on pulling the trigger. Everything was, and I think it became ingrained on us because we trained so often. We, this was just kind of a a carry on of our training. And so you fight like you train and to bring the emotional or mental aspect in, uh, we talked about it afterwards, you know, and most people didn't have anything to say, uh, to talk about their feelings. We just talked about the mission. And so I think as we stayed focused on what the mission was and how we were helping everything, it didn't seem to have a, a big effect on, on most people. The one mission I, I do remember that had the potential to be very devastating mentally was another day VI and we're chasing this guy and he's a bad guy. He is just a bad guy and and we want him real bad. Well, Intel tells us that he is in a vehicle with a driver and those are the only ones in the vehicle and we're chasing him for a while. We get up to him. We engage the vehicle to disable it. This is going to be, we want this guy because we think he's going to bring us on to more intelligence. And one of the things that came into play for this was we had gotten a new uh, soft safe trigger. So before it was a hard, uh, I'm sorry, not trigger, but soft safe uh, switch. Before you had to have either 
take your hand off the control and arm yourself or the guy not flying would do that. Well, we decided we'd like the ability is because it is a single pilot aircraft and sometimes it's just easier to do it yourself. So they put a push button on the top of the cyclic and we would fly with it in a hard armed, but a soft safe. So meaning if you wanted to arm the system, you just push down the button and you were now armed and ready to shoot. Well, with um, adrenaline <laughs> and the excitement of everything uh, that can be good and bad. So on this particular mission, the car stops and the guy is, he gets out of the right side and has got a gun. And so the ISR is, is telling us all this and, and we're just right there. And so we're informed, engage the vehicle. Guy's got a gun getting out. And so I bump over. And meaning I'm, I'm at the top of my climb. I bump. Now I'm looking right at the vehicle and I am soft arming myself, soft safing myself, soft arming myself because I'm, you know, having difficulty with this new uh, this new apparatus. And so I'm like, son of a bitch, I'm not able to shoot. Well, just as I'm, you know, cursing myself, the left rear door opens up and a woman gets out carrying her baby. And I am like, oh, my God, that was so lucky I didn't shoot. Well, when Lee doesn't shoot, he's got to tell Trail something so Trail knows what to do. You know, did you not shoot because you didn't mean to or did you not shoot because you had a weapons malfunction? And so, you know, and this is all happening within seconds microseconds. And so as my mind realizes, wait, there's a woman getting out with a baby. I'm making my break. and I key the mic to tell trail not to engage. Well, I hit the mic, don't engage. And woof, a rocket comes out and hits that car right next to it. And all I can see is the display just fills up with smoke, dust and dirt. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. God, what has happened? And so we make a hard break. Excuse me. Come back around. And as the ISR feed is still directed on the car, when everything clears, there's this woman with her holding her baby running from the car still. And you're like, how in the hell did that happen? You know, and she must have been a good person. Her God was looking out after her because uh, no damage, no injury to, to her, or the baby. You know, obviously, we found this out later when we got on the ground, boots on the ground, the assault force. But it was just something that happened just like this. And watching that, like, woman, baby, don't shoot. Boom. You know, this rocket was right there. And we both did exactly what we were supposed to. You know, this was a, a misfortune of events. This knucklehead had his family with him and we missed it. Didn't know he was in there or she was in there. But to cap off the mission, so she goes off to the side. He keeps running. The 60s land, put their ground assault force in to cure her. And now they're doing a slow, methodical walk through the desert. And this guy is a suicide vest IED maker. And so they're real nervous that he's got a suicide vest on. And he did. And so the ISR sees him and they think they see him. They're trying to tell me where he's at. But this guy's at 15,000 feet looking through a, a soda straw, it, trying to tell me where he's at. And it's so difficult during the day which is another reason uh, we came up with the FAC-A program. To talk somebody onto a target during the day, going from big to small, is one of the most difficult things. You know, an, an example would be, okay, hey, F-15, do you see Baghdad? Yes. Go west 20 miles. Uh, there's another little town. Do you see that? Yes. And you just incrementally talk them down, talk them down, talk them down. And uh, it really is an art. And, and the good JTACs are, you know, awesome at doing that. 
But in this event, we just couldn't find him because he was dug in there real. Uh, he did a good job of burying himself. And I, I shot once or twice. I said, hey, where is he at in relation to that? And uh, we had some some difficulty communicating with the ISR. He, I think, was a fairly new guy. And so by this time, the ground force is, you know, wanting to get things done. So they said, okay, just come off. We'll find him. And so the dog handler is uh, moving and he never saw him either. And the dog handler gets right up next to him. The guy pulls his vest, uh, kills the dog, obviously kills himself, kills the dog. And uh, the dog handler is okay. But when we debrief later that night, you know, you could tell he was, he was pretty scarred. Uh, it just there couldn't see him. Yeah, yeah, the dog handler was, you know, he lost his dog. Plus, this guy is all on him. But, but that one is one that just, I remember the most of things that could have been. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Did that, that soft safe trigger, did that remain part of your, uh, kind of the cockpit or did it adjust later? Cause it just didn't work in combat. It just took no, some it, growing it worked, pains. It, worked like a <laughs> it just, I, I got a little excited and en engaged the, switch and then wasn't sure so we engaged it again and so it was a uh, my fault yeah. it was human error gotcha and so with a little bit but we had just got him i mean i don't even think we shot him out at the range you know you sometimes you showed up at the aircraft and like hey what's that and there's a new yeah. light or a new radio or a new switch <laughs> or something and so that particular case it, i wish i'd had a little training with it so we'll, uh, we'll jump to Jessica Lynch in a second. And it's just amazing. You're a part of all these things. But one of the topics that came up when I interviewed Blaber last time about the book Tillman's Last Battle is this unfortunate series of events that happens to Tillman's platoon, specifically to the platoon leader who's in the mountains in Afghanistan in a place he's never been. He's, the whole platoon has only been there eight days when they have this battle. And there's new technology. I mean, it's 2004, but there's still like, obviously, especially in the special ops community, you're getting new tech all the time. So they've got HF radio, they've got SATCOM, and now they've got their email chat. And right. this platoon leader has a broken down Humvee. And he's like, I need it to be airlifted out or I need to blow it in place. And he has to wait six hours outside of a village, outside the wire to get a response from a commander in a talk in Bagram, basically. And Effectively, what's happening is this platoon leader on the ground is being micromanaged by seven layers of commanders because of technology. Like there's so much technology that he has to sit and wait for commands to come down. And I was just trying to reflect on the aviation community. I felt like that didn't really happen. Despite the technology we had, we were still kind of responding to whoever the ground force commander was. But I wanted to ask you if you noticed any of that. As technology evolved, did you feel like you were more tethered to headquarters, the command, or did you still feel like you could operate autonomously when you were out on a flight? I definitely saw that. And when I was the LNO with the ground force oh, living yeah. with, I saw it more. But as a commander um, bearing the responsibility for everything, it, I think it's only human nature that you become more risk averse if you don't have all those tools that uh, in a hundred percent scenario, meaning, all right, your ISR, I've got two ISR platforms. Now one of them's gone. You're like, uh, well, I only got one camera looking at this. Well, now you don't have any. And I have seen where we've canceled missions because we didn't have ISR assets. And it, it the, Boots on the ground commander was, hey, boss, what did we do before we had all this? You know, we, we went out and did it. And the more senior commander said, yeah, you know, but our chance of success is better. It'll be there tomorrow night. And, and I think it was a good call. But it, it became part of the planning checklist. Uh, for men force. And so men force being how many helicopters do we need to get there with how many assaulters? 
how many fixed wing do we need? How many uh, Casavac in case somebody gets shot? How many ISR? And so we had all this as part of our planning uh, scenario. And ISR being there was was uh, it gradually became a men package. Mm -hmm. No, it makes sense. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at the Saddam capture or bin Laden or something like on those missions, if you have to go a little bit less because you have to get that mission done, makes sure. sense. But in some of these other ones, like, Hey, we can just wait till tomorrow. It makes a lot of sense to, to be more risk averse there, especially when we look back on these wars now. Um, yeah. All right. And so I, th I think it makes us more effective as well. You know, when you can go back and somebody said, you guys went in there and shot up the wrong building and killed an innocent family. Like, nope, here's the videotape yeah, of exactly what you did. So it, it's it's a little bit CYA as well. Yeah, that's true. Winning hearts and minds kind of thing. <laughs> um, I'm interested to hear about Jessica Lynch. Um, I didn't realize you were part of this one too. Yeah, so Jessica Lynch was something that we weren't aware of until... We get a call and said, hey, get the aircraft ready. You're going to load them up on C-130s and fly them down to uh, south into the Brits AO area of operation. And we didn't really uh, operate down there because of the sectors. The Americans were up north. They're down there. But this particular mission, we weren't sure what was going on. We were just told to load our aircraft, go down south for a couple of days. And so we went down to airfield by Najaf. And uh, eventually, we're told what the mission is. It's uh, going to be an American soldier, <clears throat> excuse me, POW rescue. And so the ground forces is down there. <clears throat> excuse me, the Navy SEALs. The aviation assets are down there, which is us. And since this is going to be... Um, highly publicized it, it seemed like let's get everybody in on it everybody get a, a you know a piece of the pie which i kind of say that negatively because it, it did complicate things more but i can also see it as part of you know the, the hey we want to show what good things the the u.s is doing over here and all these units uh obviously you have to have support for for these type of wars what have you so they decided to bring the marine aviation off of a uh, uh i'm not sure what type of ship it was but it was uh off the coast and they were going to come in in their ch-46s and carry part of the assault force and we had never worked with them they weren't there to plan with us so it, it was an added uh not a derogatory factor, but just something that made it more difficult. And so the plan was for the assault force to go in, rescue. We knew at least one person there, and we knew that there were some, some casualties, and they wanted to do it uh, fairly quickly. The status of the objective was changing. So we thought that there was a hundred, couple hundred uh, Fedayeen there and that this was going to be a gunfight. Well, it turned out that there were those individuals there, but now we're thinking uh, the intel is that they had left. And so maybe they're not there. And so, you know, as far as the guys who were going on the objective, well, there's either going to be 200 there and it's going to be a gunfight or no one's going to be there. So we didn't really know what to expect. And so the plan was, is the, our unit task force would take the SEALs in, put them on the, the hospital, and they would uh, initiate the rescue. And the CH-47s with the Marines would bring in the blocking forces, which were the Rangers, and secure the perimeter. Jeez, this is joint. Right. I mean, yeah, this, this is joint with like 24 hours of planning. Marines bringing Rangers in, SEALs going like you yeah, all. It, wow. it truly really was. Plus, there's now a Marine ground force that is going to be uh, south of the river. 
And their job was to draw attention away from the objective area and kind of create a diversion. So we do the plan. We execute the next night. And as we're inbound on the assault, it, it was a good 25 minute flight at the prescribed time the Marine ground force opens up and I wasn't sure that it was the Marines. Cause all you can see is tracers going everywhere. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, this is, this is going to be the 200 uh, Fedayeen version. I mean, there's a gunfight going on. And as we get closer, it, it becomes obvious that, well, it's all coming from one side. And so the Marines are just laying waste to whatever's on the other side of that river. And as we get a little closer, it's like, okay, guys, you can stop now. <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, it, it, we're a little worried about the collateral damage from their fires, but they did a great job of doing exactly what they were supposed to, uh, drawing attention to them. We do the infill. The SEALs go into the objectives. The AHs go overhead. We've got two teams, one on the east, one on the west. We're on the west side. And now we're waiting for the blocking force to come in. And so this is the 46s. And they're a minute or two behind, which was planned. But the one thing I remember about that is I see the 46s coming in and they have their bright position lights on. And we're all blacked out. We have the infrared and you can only see the infrared lights with night vision goggles. And so the guys on the ground, they don't have NVGs. They can't see us. But we can see each other for safety uh, with the night vision goggles. And so the Marines have these bright lights on that can be seen with the naked eye. And so we have a code word, check lights. And so I come over the helicopter common frequency and said, hey, Marine, whatever their call sign was, check lights, nothing. Oh, they're getting closer and closer and check lights. And now they're just entering the objective area and I'm like, check lights. And finally, one of them says, yeah, that's our SOP, you know, to, to keep these bright lights on. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. And, and by this time, it was uh, I guess it was apparent that no one was there and that there wasn't going to be a big gunfight. But still, you know, all there has to be is one person with a rifle to shoot at that light. And. Uh, when some when there's a downed aircraft, then it involves everybody and the mission kind of switches to that. So it would have taken away from the overall uh, intent of the mission. So sometimes doing those joint efforts at the last minute is uh, maybe not the best idea, but they did a good job. They did exactly what they were supposed to in field. And then they went back off to holding. And while we're we're in an overhead cast orbit. Uh, we have our FLIR and we're looking and it, it just became very sad because we could see where they had dug the graves and buried those uh, American soldiers. And we weren't sure of the total number, but I believe that there was uh, seven bodies that were buried and two were still in the morgue and then Jessica still being alive. And you could see the ground force going over there and, and digging each one of those graves up, um, putting the soldiers in, in a bag to come home. So that was, you know, very uh, disheartening to, to watch that, knowing what was there or what we thought would be there. And uh, they did a great job of, you know, paying them honors and, and bringing them back. And so, the, the mission wraps up with them bringing her out. Uh, she's put on a 60 and escorted back. I think she's escorted back by the other AH team. Uh, and we stay there to make sure that all the ground force gets off. Cause now there's a gaff, a ground assault force that arrives. They uh, finish up all the actions on the objective and then they take off. And by now the sun's coming up. And so we ensure that everybody's off the objectives, change frequencies, and we start heading back towards Najaf. Well, I stayed up the 
objective push because I had a bunch of radios. And as we get a couple minutes out, I hear a radio call. Hey, farm it. Think we got uh, uh, an ambush in front of us. And it's the ground assault force calling us. And I'm like, what? So I'd make contact with him and said, hey, all right, stand by. And not being the flight lead, uh, you don't want to do any coordination unless you have to without him. So I call him up and said, hey, switch back to objective freak. think there may be an issue. And so the flight lead switches over and they're like, yeah, we see a couple of tanks up here. Uh, we, we don't think they're ours. And so <laughs> I'm listening on the radio like, oh, Jesus, tanks. Uh well, this didn't turn into a, a, a good sunrise. And so we go over there and we bump and we're prepared to, to we have a, a different type of rocket called a RA-79. And it is uh, able to penetrate something, probably not a tank metal skin, but uh, with our 50 cal and we're prepared to, to bump and shoot on them. And it turned out it was U.S. forces. So as we got closer and we're looking at them with the flare, you know, we're like, whew, thank God. And so it, the mission ended with uh, everybody returning back to Najaf, debrief, found out that she was uh, going to be okay and that uh, all the others, unfortunately, were deceased. Pretty, pretty amazing, though, you, that, you know, we go to those links to bring them back. Um, I'm, I'm sure it was tough watching that, especially to your point of like seeing the, maybe the disturbed ground on the FLIR and then them having to dig him up, but bringing him back is something we're always, you know, we, we pride ourselves on. Um, I thought we could cover two stories for you as an LNO. Then I've got two of the funny ones queued up and I think we can wrap there, Steve, if that's okay. But the sure. LNO side, certainly like we've alluded to it, we touched on it last time, but this is, you're not flying. You're the aviation liaison officer to the ground force, basically. So you're the expert on all air assets. Um, you know, as much as you can share, like what the ground unit was that you're liaison for, and then this SAS mission, I thought might be an interesting one to touch on. Yeah. So, so the uh, the Brits coming into it was uh, very colorful. Great guys. Uh, my job was, I was a CW four had never been out of the line company and was coming up for my CW5 look. Um, well, it, and so it was twofold. So I had been rowing the boat for a while, meaning, you know, at the line company working, I was coming up for promotion and I wanted to be able to say that I had done everything within my power to get promoted. So I didn't want to, one of the reasons I didn't get promoted was, well, yeah, yeah, but you never came up to battalion or higher. You just stayed at the line company, which was accepted in the unit. So about three years, four years into uh, being with B Company in the AH, I took a job as the green LNO, which is working with the Special Forces. And there's two LNOs. One lives with them at Fort Bragg, and the other stays with the unit back at Fort Campbell. And that is usually a senior captain or a major. Well, we were real short on commission guys, so. I took the job as the rear LNO and we swapped. The other guy was a good friend of mine, W4, and we would go live with the ground unit for 90 days. And we did all the planning, uh, or a lot of the planning. We did the aviation liaison duties. And after in the 90 days, you know, you just went back and forth. And it, it, it's, it was very demanding. And it was very demanding because you're the only aviation, aviation guy down there. The ground force is wanting something. You're told certain criteria from your boss. And, you know, you're trying to appease both of them. Yeah. You're trying to... You're working make for two people. Force. Exactly. Exactly. And, and you never... The aviation commander never wanted to look bad. The flight leads didn't want to look bad. So, you know, it was agreed upon, hey, guess who's going to look bad? The L&L. And, and and that's the way it should be, <laughs> you know, that... Yeah, to have a bad guy and, and it should be me because they need to have that working relationship boots on the ground. And, uh, and I found out a couple times, you know, that, yeah, that sucks uh, being in that position. But the, 
the relationship that I built with them, I, I thought was pretty good. Um, to be able to, as a senior guy there, I had a lot of experience. So I was able to help plan missions. And by the time the aviation, because they were in Baghdad, the aviation units were in Balad. So it took them, you know, by the time they're notified an hour to get down there. So 45 minutes to an hour. And I could have a lot of the stuff planned. So they'd show up. I'd give them a 10 minute brief. This was if it was a quick mission and they could go out and execute. That's and awesome. so the ground force really liked that. And, and that became uh, the standard while I was there. Um, and I tell you, my, my memory became so sharp because I was always busy working. And I, that's one thing I remember from that is just, They'd ask me something and man, I could remember that. And I probably left and went back, you know, as a pilot and just went back to being dumb and forgetting stuff on there. But I had to be sharp. And, uh, and everyone we sent down there as a, uh, aviation liaison were good guys, you know, cause you didn't want to look like an ass. Yeah. And put your good guys there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 mm. Don't remember anything where I felt bad, you know, screwing up in front of the ground force commander. There were a couple of times when we had uh, demanding ground force commanders that wanted us to fly with bad weather. And I can't remember if I said this. I don't think I did the first time, but. Hey, you guys can go fly, right? No, we can't go fly. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if things get bad, you can go fly, right? No, we can't go fly. But I mean, if our guys are getting shot or something, you can go out there, right? No, we cannot go flying. You shouldn't be out driving in this, you know, it's just horrible. And so we had the opportunity when our aircraft were down there one night and, uh, we're just waiting for a mission. It was slow, bad weather. So I asked one of the, the little bird guys, I said, Hey, would you mind doing a little traffic pattern around the, the city here? And he goes, oh, man, it's bad. I'm like, I want to get the ground force commander up, show them what it's like. That's brilliant. And they knew exactly what I wanted. So they're like, hell yeah, I'll do that. So we take him up and maybe five, 10 minute flight, come back and land. And he comes in and goes, Steve, I will never question you again when you say you guys can't fly because of weather. And uh, it, it was just one of those things where you have to see it for yourself. But uh, and I think that helped our relationship. Um, with the SAS, so we lived there at the mission support site and owned 70% of the, the area. Well, the Brits came in and whether it was the SAS or the SBS, this, their version of the SEALs, the Special Boat Services, um, they were doing the same type of missions, just different areas. So they had, and they spent a lot of time in, uh, in Baghdad. Well, they didn't have the aviation support that we did, um, America's great country. And so they sometimes would borrow from us or sometimes they would use the little birds to do rooftops or they'd use our ISR. And their sergeant major was just a great guy. And so I remember one night it was slow for us. He came over and asked if he could borrow ISR. I said, yeah, sure. You know, this is the feed it's on and everything. So they set their talk up for it. Well, they go out and they do a mission and we're watching their feed because we don't have anything going on. So we're like, okay, let's see what the Brits are doing. They didn't realize that they weren't the only ones that could see this feed. And so this, uh, this uh, Sergeant Major, and he was the same guy on the ground. I could tell because, you know, his, his statue, his, his, uh, his physical size. And, uh, this one guy is, is running out of a hooch and he runs over and just does this karate kick and puts this guy down hard. And, uh, it, it you know, we're watching like, Whoa, that wait, was wait, awesome. sorry, Steve. I got it. So you're saying in the talk, they're watching the feed and a sergeant major runs in and does this. Yeah. The sergeant major is on the objective, okay. you know, and usually the sergeant major isn't one of the door kickers. He's at a casualty collection point or, uh, you know, running the op on a radio. So he's standing outside all these uh, buildings and this one guy comes running out, like he's trying to get the hell out of there. 
and the sergeant major just drops his clipboard or whatever he has. I'm sure he's still got his weapon slung and just drops this guy with a kick. And uh, so, so later that night, I go walk over because it's still dead. And I'm like, hey, so how did the uh, how did the ISR work out for you guys? Oh, great, 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 mate. I appreciate it. Like, yeah. I'm like, um, yeah, it looked like things were real, real good on the objective. He goes, what do you mean? I'm like, well, yeah, you, you know, you're not the only ones that are watching that, right? You go, no, I didn't realize that. <laughs> I said, did you see everything? I said, yeah, that was a pretty good kick. He goes, oh, yeah. It's, but it, it was just funny, you know, because uh, <laughs> he, he wasn't expecting that at all. That's great. He probably loved to just be in the action again, I'm sure. like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, you could tell. But back in the day when he used to. Uh, just one other quick story on the, yeah. the Brits. So the HLZ was getting pretty busy. And so they had Pumas and Lynx and Lynx were their ISR asset. And they only had so many radios that were compatible with ours. And it was, um, we never really did come to a good understanding because we said, this is the, the HLZ frequency. You must be on it to come in. And if they were doing, like I said, they did a lot of missions around Baghdad. If they were doing that, they wouldn't come up that frequency. They'd just take off and land because they had to get to their tactical, which you can understand, but there's also the safety aspect. So I kind of started running the um, CSS, uh, which is the support missions. We'd have Chinooks and Blackhawks come in to deliver people, uh, supplies, fuel, and other things. And just because uh, I was very familiar with aviation. It just made sense that I started working that as well when there weren't tactical missions. So now I'm out on the HLZ and there is just a buttload of traffic going on because we have the CSS flights coming in. We have the tactical task force aircraft spooling up and we've got the Brits and the HLZ is just full. And I've got my little tool belt on with my radio on there and my headset and I'm directing everybody. Okay. Yeah. You can come in, you land here. No, you can't do this. And here comes this Lynx, which is like a Huey about the same size dual engine. And he's coming in and I'm like, I'm trying to talk to him. Nothing trying to talk to him. And he's, he's going to land somewhere. And I'm looking around like, man, there's no place to land. And he keeps coming in and he lands less than a rotor disc between probably four aircraft. And, uh, and I'm like, Holy moly, you know, that could have been catastrophic. So now I'm a little pissed. And, uh, and this is the summertime. I've got a t-shirt on shorts and my little Barney Fife belt with my, <laughs> with my radio on there. So I walk over to the, pilot's door and uh open the pilot door and he's looking at me and i'm like you this and he's like yeah that and so we start slugging it out right there you know just fighting uh, yeah i'm trying to you know i'm telling him my point of view and he's yelling at me from there and, and both of us had had it and uh so finally we realized all right you know that's not the best thing and uh he's shuts down and tells me, yeah, I was about ready to run out of fuel. I didn't have any choice. And I'm like, well, you know, you could have caused a, a lot of damage here, deaths and everything coming in. So we didn't really come to a, a an agreeable, you know, ending, but uh, just uh, a part of my duties down there is the aviation LNO. I wasn't told that that was one of them, you know, that I'd have to get into physical confrontations with anyone, but Seemed like the thing to do at the time. <laughs> I love it. Um, two of the lighter hearted things that I saw on this list. And, and then I think we can kind of come to a wrap here. At least they sound humorous, but, uh, one of them is, I mean, I hate even mentioning this, a ticket on an airfield. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. this isn't really humorous, but it's, I, I don't even know how to like, please just share the story. Cause I've heard but these before. Sad. It's sad. Yeah. Well, as with everything, once you get uh prolonged activity on something, then it falls into the, 
you know, the garrison rules and regulations. So we had been in Balad for a while and not a lot of people in Balad go outside the gate. You know, when they get into, into country, they're there in the Balad proper, going to the PX and, and I'm not saying anything bad about that, but to them, it's just, you know, Hey, they get up, they work eight to five, they're off two days a week. Whereas we're, 24 seven, the whole time we're there. So always working, uh, every night we were doing missions unless we had uh, bad weather or it was a slow night for some reason. And so our mentality is a little different than there. And we had what we call the, the hoopty, the, some old vehicle we were able to, to obtain somehow. And we got done with a mission. We jumped in the hoopty to go to the good chow hall because ours was always powdered eggs and some junk. We, we didn't really uh, have a big breakfast. So we were going to go to the big chow hall and get some, some good breakfast. And as we're driving there, I think we've got four people, two in the front, two in the back, and they've got a roadblock up. And so the MPs, uh, or I think they're actually Air Force SPs. They stop us and they're like, okay, we're just doing some random checks here. And you could tell the guy was kind of embarrassed. Yeah, just making sure you're not speeding and you got your seatbelts on. Uh, I see you don't have your seatbelt. I'm like, no, I do not have my seatbelt on. No one's got their seatbelt on, huh? No, no one's got their seatbelt on. And he's looking at me and you can... Like I said, I, it was awkward because you could tell he didn't want to do it. But he was like, you will get your ass out there and make sure everyone's in compliance. So he, all right, I'll be right back. So he walks away, comes back a couple minutes later. And he's got a ticket for me. He goes, uh, this is a ticket for not wearing your seatbelt. And by now, it's just kind of humorous. I'm like, hmm, what do I do with this? Well, you have to give it to your commander. So I just turn next to me and give it to my commander who's sitting right next to me. And we both look at the kid and the kid looks at us and you're like, yeah, I'm sorry. You can go. <laughs> and this drives off and, and we're all laughing. We're like, well, it just kept us from breakfast for 10 minutes was about the worst thing. Oh, poor guy. But, but just that mentality started, you know, and from there on. And that's why when McChrystal, excuse me, General McChrystal, uh, wanted to take away the the Burger Kings, the green beans, so soldiers could concentrate on what the real mission was. And I don't know if you remember that, but I mean, there was revolution. Uh, everyone was just used to that, and they were not going to, to come off that. I did not know that. When I was deployed, they still had the green beans, at least on our at Salerno and Coast. Um but that was 08. So I don't know when that happened, but I could see the uproar from people. Oh yeah. yeah. When general McChrystal took overall charge, he was all, this is coming down. And he was, I think he had actually given uh, his, his uh, underlings the, the directive to make that happen. And they came back to him and said, boss, no, we can't. The, the commanders are all, you know, up in arms. And so if it had been up to a uh, general McChrystal, wow. we wouldn't have had that. Okay. Which well, I think was overkill. Yeah. Um, the, the other one that I just thought we'd end on here from a humorous, I think it's humorous looking back, I would assume, but probably not at the moment, but jumping into trees. A night jump. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, well, part, of my, part of my duties as the aviation liaison was to stay on jump status. And so when I got, when I was in the CAV, I wanted to go to air assault school and airborne school. So I put in my 4187 and, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And they're like, yeah, that costs money. We don't have TDY money for pilots to go to jump school. Forget about it. And so uh, it didn't happen. And then when I got into the unit, since we are an airborne unit, that we were authorized to go. And so I went as a fairly new member there because if I had gotten hurt, they're not really losing anything, but to let a flight lead or somebody go who breaks their leg, they weren't all about that, understandably. So I go to jump school. I do my five jumps 
uh, was a, we jumped C-130, C-141s, and was told, yep, that's probably it. That's the extent of your jump career. So I was like, okay, well, I did that. I'm happy that I did it. So now I come back and I'm the LNO and they're like, okay, uh, you're going to go on jump status. And how do you feel about uh, MFF, military free fall? I'm like, oh, mm, yeah, yeah, I, I can do that. And we had had two previous LNOs. And the, usually it was the forward LNOs. It was the warrant officers that would go to MFF because they would jump with the ground force. And we actually had in what we'll call it in the regular army that we had one of our LNOs was had a combat military free fall jump. So he jumped with uh, one of the ground forces and got the the mustard stain above That's his awesome. MFF. Yeah. So as far as I know, he's the only one who's done that, you know, now there's other types of units that may have done that stuff. But, uh, so I, I was, I was thinking, well, that can be dangerous. You know, I've heard a lot of guys getting hurt on that. So I was looking forward to it, but kind of not, but it, it never came to fruition anyway. So I'm off track a little bit. So I do stick with static line jumps and as I show up for pre-jump training, they're like, who are you? I said, well, I'm the LNO. I'm on jump status now. And these are all members of our 3-5 platoon because they have to stay on jump status. 3-5 so is the refueling and rearming part of yeah. the aviation unit. And so, so they jumped into Panama and, and, you know, they have an actual jump mission to make sure that a forward arming refueling point is set up for the helicopters to come later and, and refuel. And these guys all have a bunch of jumps and here's some W4 knucklehead showing up with five jumps and I haven't jumped in seven years. It, or Yeah, I think it was... Um, anyway, it, it was a good amount of years and they're like, well, why are you here? This is a night mass tack, meaning that the jump's going to be at night with full combat equipment, just throwing you out, get as many as they can. I'm like, well, because they kept denying my jumps and now I'm a pay loss if I don't jump by Tuesday. And they're like, ah, okay. So they appease me and we go through all the, the training and, uh, I get to talking with him and we become a little bit more buddy buddy and goes, okay, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you at the last of the stick, which means I'm going to be one of the last jumpers. Make sure that, you know, you don't have any problems and you don't go under the trees and it's almost a full moon. So it's okay, great. I appreciate that. I haven't, I haven't done any night jumps. So we go up over the, the drop zone and we make a couple passes and everyone goes out. So this next pass, I'm going to be going out. And as they start the DZ, the green light comes on, a couple second delay, a couple people go out, a couple more people go out. And I'm just like, man, this is taking forever. And I'm, I'm the last on the stick. So then I go out. So I'm the last person. So the whole idea of not jumping into the trees by being short of the DZ was now I'm going to go into the trees because I'm the last one overshooting. So as, as I come out, I check the shoot, do all the things I'm supposed to. And it's just bright with all this moon out. And I look around, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure those are trees and I'm going to clear them. So woof, I go into the trees and was lucky enough to, to go all the way through them, you know, bang myself up at the bottom. A couple others got stuck in the tree. But so my first uh, jump after jump school was was at night into the trees. Did you end up like just pinballing down them and landing on the ground at the base? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And did you have a combat what, load out or no? No. And so they let me jump without uh, Thank a God. Rock. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. There was two other guys, you know, they bring a cherry picker out there to get the guys who are stuck in the trees. So, which is an <laughs> hours and hours event to get it, bring it out. And so the, uh, the jump master was, was real good about it. He goes, yeah, hmm, probably should have had you in the middle of the stick. Yeah, whatever. But I wound up doing, I don't know, another dozen jumps or so and got to jump out of a Casa and Chinook and some other things. So that was fun. That's cool. Well, um, 
Steve, I think this is probably a great place to wrap up. I will say for people who didn't listen to the first one, we always ask these questions like, what did you carry with you and would you do it again? And for the carry with you, you mentioned that you you didn't really carry anything. It was kind of a sterile um, on your person. You didn't have anything. You, you didn't have anything sentimental or good luck charm. But you did mention you had a kick-ass go bag that other people envied <laughs> a little bit. So we did touch on that and some of the stuff that you carried in there. And then- when I asked I'm you going if you do tomorrow and I'm going to bring that bag with me. I still have it. One of my favorite bags. I believe it. Um, and then when I asked you if you do it all again, you, you said yes. And rightly so brought up the family aspect. And so I just wanted to spend a second there where uh, you remained um, with the family throughout, which is not easy in, in this world. And you somehow managed it. And one of the things that you put down here was the change in homecoming um, over time with 15 plus deployments for years at a time and how that first time it sounds like a lot of fanfare. And then over time it just became, Hey, dad's gone again. Um, people yeah. aren't there to greet you or see you off. And I just thought we might be able to end there. If you could just share a little bit of that experience. Cause I think that might be lost on some people who see these big homecomings, um, as the military redeploys. And that might not have been what you saw over time. Yeah. And I think to maybe go back and, and to be able to to have that long of a career and to be gone as much. And before 9-11, I was gone 230 days out of the year for training. And then 9-11, you know, we're gone for deployments. And then we come back and guess what? We still have to train. So you're gone for uh, real world deployments overseas and then you come back and you're gone for a week, two weeks. And so a lot of time away from the, the family. And I think what allowed me to stay that the 21 years there is just knowing when to take a knee. And I did five years uh, in, in the first unit I was at and then was off for not off, but away with the family uh maybe 14 months when i went to dli went to the black hawk transition and all that was kind of planned from our end you know my wife and i made that decision to get back recharge the batteries and then i went and did three years rowing the boat again hard then had a year off going to degree completion back with the family and each time it was it was calculated to uh, get back, make sure I'm spending time with my kids. So my wife's not the only one raising our kids and very fortunate, very fortunate that I was able to do that because a lot of people are in a situation where they're gone 12, 18 months, and then they're back and they can't control any of that. I did see people who were felt the need to keep rowing the boat, you know, eight years in a row. I'm like, yeah. And it shows, man, you, you got to take a break. And for those that didn't, you know, there's the divorces, there's not that relationship with your children that you want. But uh, as you brought up, it, it became a new way of life. Hey, dad's leaving. Oh, okay. Hey, pops. What, how long are you going for this? 30, 60, 90? Ah, this is uh, only 30. Okay, cool. All right. Well, we'll see you when you get back. And it was just, it, it became a way of life. And, uh, the first time that that happened, you know, I called my wife and uh, told her we were coming back, you know, try to OPSEC, you, you keep things on the down low, but just, hey, I'll be back next Tuesday. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was going to go and go to uh, Jazz on the Lawn with, you know, my girlfriend. I'm like, well, you just go ahead and do that. You know, I don't, I don't need you there. But when you show up, you know, and you get off the plane and you walk to work and you put all your stuff away and you go out in the parking lot and, yeah, no shit. She's really not there. <laughs> like, Whoa, okay. And so the, that was the first time I really realized that, hey, this is this is the new norm. And uh, it, it was uh, just a way of life for 11 years. It's a, I feel like that's a fitting way to end kind of um, the real impact that a lot of people don't see. But the fact that you kept your family together and you still have a relationship with your children and um, it's not something you take for granted within that community. So Steve, I'm, I'm so grateful for your time again. Love this. Like 
uh, to see on paper what 30 years looks like is pretty amazing. Thanks for taking the time with us again. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. I had a good time talking with you, and uh, I, I love the show. Watch every episode of it, and uh, looking forward to the Pete Blaber episode. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that combat story. It's hard not to like Steve's outlook and approach. So much humility. You practically have to drag a lot of this stuff out of him. And, you know, at one point, I'd love to sit down with him and somebody who flew with him so that we could hear even more about what he did and, and talk through one of those battles. But a few listener comments that I wanted to share. And I went back to the first interview with Steve, and there's some great ones. Um, this first one is from a, uh, a subscriber, and it's Joe Gagsnos2312. And he says, why would you go back to the big army after 160? There's no comparison. And Steve kind of touches on it here. To get promoted, he felt like uh, it would have been his best foot forward to go out and give back to the rest of the, to the big army and then come back in. So he did that a few times. And I think he also shared that it was a way to take a knee in some cases. Uh, not all, certainly not in that LNO role that he described, but um, I would have to agree with you. I wasn't in 160th. I really, really, always look back and wish that I had the chance to be there, especially after having seen Big Army and then seeing the agency. I think 160th would have just been so, so important, uh, so impressive. And I hate that I wasn't there, but I hear your point, Joe, on this one. Another one from a subscriber from Jet Obey 5656 and he says, Steadfast American is what I've watched. September 1st, 2023, I thank both of you and all. And then lastly, this is a great comment and it's from Dave Wiley 654 and he says I'm going to be brutally honest as a veteran I haven't cried that hard in years his pain of losing his flight lead hurt me and brought me back to a lot of memories thank you so much Ryan and thank you Steve Steve you didn't miss anything buddy man I'm just uh you know, I'm getting goosebumps just reading this because um, you could tell it's coming from a place of uh having gone through similar challenges and this this of course is a reference for those who haven't seen the first interview and we didn't touch on it at all in the second this was the loss of jamie weeks another just phenomenal storied pilot that was so close to steve for so long and you could just hear the pain in steve's voice as he's talking about jamie so again that's another great reason if you haven't heard the first uh first interview to check it out but thank you so much everybody for listening for supporting us uh for these positive comments and uh yeah stay tuned we got some good ones coming stay safe y'all